I want to say good evening, but it's still good morning. It's 1041. I got something I want to show you. Now, Sister Ashley Brown, you let me know. You, you hit a special button when you see this. Now, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I guess I done changed a little bit. Let me see if I can. I got, oh, look out. Oh, look out now. Oh, 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 look out. You can't even see their face. Look at that. Ooh. <laughs> Boy, y'all messed up now. I didn't get a house dog. Oh, this is my emotional support dog. No, I'm playing. Listen, uh, this is Princess Leia. <laughs> Listen, I know y'all going to mess with me. I always say, listen, you better get you a dog, dog. You need a dog that eat out of out of a, a look at it. You need a dog that eat out of a, 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 a frying pan. Look at that. Oh, oh, look at that. So I got me. Look, don't y'all mess with me. Don't y'all mess with me. Look, look at this. Scared. She's scared to death. Heart just beating all fast. Don't y'all mess with me. All y'all that got house dogs. I understand. I get it. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that's that's never gonna happen again. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, you missed it. You missed it. You missed it. I had that's Leia. That's the new. That's that's not my dog. Kenny gone. I wouldn't have no dog like that. Anyway, listen. We're gonna go ahead and get started. <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and get started. I need to. Change gears anyway. Uh, I want to bring the the new. Nah, that Kennedy has a dog, Sister Brown, Ashley Brown. That's her little dog. The dogs I like, they they can't be in the house. Mm -mm. No, I ain't. Mm -mm. She's she doing her thing. But uh, anyway, anyway, cut this off. Finish this water up. All right, we're going to go ahead and dive in and get started, get started. I wanted to just kind of tease everybody because I always say, you need your dog, dog. And here I got this little bit of dog, ain't big as a cup of coffee sitting in my lap. But uh, at, at any rate, at any rate, we're going to go ahead and stop now with the with my little teasing. I'll stop with my teasing. Um, kind of have a pretty serious situation I want to address uh, on this morning. It's always good to start out with some nice, kind, you know, clean, fun. I uh, hope everyone is logging on. Sister Brown, God bless you. Good morning to you as well. Um, um, Sometimes people ask me the question, you know, how do you know what to preach? You know, is it some kind of dream you give and, and some kind of sign or signal. It was always taught to me, and it has proven to be true, that you pray Sunday night for Sunday morning. I know you just finished preaching, teaching, ministering in that way. You just came out the pulpit, you know, per se. And, you know, whisper a prayer, Lord, lead me. Uh, Lord, guide me. It It helps you to stay you know, close with God, to lean and depend on God. And I've always tried to keep that as a a practice. Um, I know God may deal with people, you know, ministers differently. I can't say that there's a cookie cutter way. But another way is you look at the needs, concerns, and situations of the church. Uh, many of you may remember it was in July and August and September of 2007. That is what led to my first ever sermon series. The church was about to move. We were dealing with the airport commission. And uh, some of you may remember, I preached a sermon series entitled, Everything is Going to Be All Right. I prayed. I looked at the current condition of what we were going through. And I felt convicted that, okay, we need some encouragement. We need to know from God's word that he's going to take care of everything. We need to be put at ease and be reminded of who's really in charge. And I say that to say this. 
uh, this morning, that's a similar approach I'm taking. Uh, exact approach, actually. Um, looking at the condition uh, of things, uh, looking at how the civil unrest, uh, unarmed citizens being killed by agents of the state, um, it's a repetitive thing. Uh, my son is 17. I've had to have the talk with him many times over. Uh, I went to take him to a play last year. It was for extra credit somewhere, Main Street, North Little Rock, some theater on, yeah, I guess it was Main Street. And I got there, it was about 9.30. It was a fall night, it was cold. And he had a hood on, I didn't think anything of it. And I was across the street, he had to walk down, go across the intersection and run toward me because it was chilly. And RJ is my height now. He was a little bit shorter then. He's six feet tall, just in a goofy 11th grader. But as he ran across the street and he kind of jogged toward the car, there were two older ladies and they were a little bit startled. And I'm, I guess in some ways, rightfully so. But I thought, look at how that situation can get out of hand. To them, maybe they thought it was danger. To him, he just had on the hood, walk, jogging a little bit, trying to get to the car. That misunderstanding in many cases has led to people being killed. Um, I served in the military and there were many situations um, I'll say to where uh, racial tensions were at an all-time high. Uh, things have changed for the better in many cases. Uh, some situations, things have still stayed the same. Uh, I, I came across a story during the Korean War. I listened to NPR, National Public Radio. I, I, I love that informative, you know, some of it I like, but, you know, some of it I don't. But they were telling about how during the Korean War, I believe it was the Koreans, they used psychological warfare because during that time in our history, racial tensions and bigotry was open and the black soldiers couldn't sleep in barracks with the white soldiers and there were racial fights and you had people that were in charge militarily that would mistreat black soldiers and the Koreans flew overhead and they dropped these leaflets. And in a leaflet, it showed a black man being hung from a tree, surrounded by many of these onlookers. And at the bottom in English, it said, why are you here? And it, it, you, you have to know how that can psychologically put you at odds, how you're in another country trying to get us to get stuff straightened out. The soldiers that you're fighting with, your white counterparts, don't even treat you fair. And when you go back to your country, you still won't get treated fairly. Even when some of the German POWs had to be transported from one place to another, the black soldiers, they used to make the black soldiers get out of their seats and stand up at the back of the train, the car of the train, and allow a German POW to take that seat. The indignity of that. The, the, the GI Bill was supposed to be afforded to all soldiers when it was instituted. They didn't allow black soldiers to have it. And even as it, as it goes forward, you know, we look at a story, there was a man uh, came home from fighting in the war. He got off at the wrong train, wrong train stop. He had just come home from fighting in foreign lands for this country. And some white people of the town saw him, chased him, beat him, and they lynched him with the American flag. You got to see the irony in that. To where a man has just served his country faithfully, put his life on the line abroad for a country that didn't 
respect his sacrifice and he was actually not killed overseas, but killed here in America. Tamir Rice, a little 12 year old boy that was shot and killed. I saw the, 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 it still is in my mind. You can't unsee this. Eric Garner, and he was a big man. And what he was doing was illegal, but it shouldn't cost you your life to be held and strangled. And he said, I can't breathe. And they choked him until he died. I mean, not to mention Trayvon Martin, how the local neighborhood watch guy. I mean, as I heard the 911 phone call, they said, okay, leave him alone. We'll send somebody. Don't pursue it. And he still pursued it. And that young man ended up losing his life. And all he had was a soda and skittles. I mean, you think of, not to mention, you know, George Floyd. You saw a police officer put his knee on his neck and he died. And even recently, Jacob Blake, I mean, I'm bringing this up. And then it, it, it even brings to mind our own personal experiences. These are national, big, huge stories. And somebody may say, well, that's just, you know, no, no I'm sure many of us black people have our own individual stories. I I was raised at 15th and Lewis. They filmed banging in Little Rock right down the street from my house. I mean, the people on camera wasn't the real gang members trouble. They were low level. The, the real people wasn't even on the television show, you know, but that's the area I came up in. I mean, what? Well, why didn't you move to Chanel? We couldn't afford it. Like, if... You think if we wanted to move, we wouldn't, if we had the money, there was a crack house next door. And like, I saw the gang fights. I saw the helicopter riding overhead and flashing the light in the neighborhood. I've been sitting on the porch and a line of cop cars were just coming by and we weren't doing the thing. Just me and a few friends just sitting on the porch talking and each one of them would flash their lights as they rode by in our face. Like, well, what was, what was that for? I've been driving. It was on Abigail or Washington, 13th, 14th and Abigail, and turned the corner. And I, two cop cars pulled in front of me. I hit the brakes. Two cop cars pulled behind me. A helicopter over my head. They shine their lights. Take your key out the ignition. Drop it on the ground. Get out the car. Put your hands in the air. Raise your T-shirt up. Turn around. Put your hands on the car. I'm like... I was just on my way to Pizza Hut to clock in for work. They come examine me, look in my trunk, look in the ashtray, look in the glove compartment. I didn't say a word. I didn't know what to say. I'm like, what I do? They said, oh, we, you, you fit the description of somebody else. All right, bye. Get out of here. What, 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 what was that all about? Like, And coming from situations like that, when I got to high school and I saw a young girl and it was a white girl and her keys were locked in the car and she called the cop and the cop came and got a Jimmy and unlocked her car door. I never thought about calling the cops if my keys were, I'm not calling the cops. They may think I'm breaking into this car. When you have that history in this country, let me tell you something. I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm happy right where I am. But I don't think it's wrong to criticize when things are out of line. And so this morning, I, I, I kind of wanted to, to touch on this because we need as Christians to be instructed not by Black Lives Matter, not by the Democratic Party, not by the Republican Party, not by LeBron James, the president, the vice president, legislature, Congress, Senate. We need to be instructed from the word of God. 
That is our chief place to get information and action. What do we do? And this is not just for the African-American, the black. This is for everybody. You know, it is love. We're going to say a prayer in a minute. And there's a couple of verses we're going to go over. But I want to say this. When, when I was in Germany, I remember walking and I worked at this little warehouse on base. And this person spoke a different language. This person spoke a different language. And I said, oh, finally, look, a black lady. And I said, ma'am, and she starts speaking Spanish to me. That's the first time I ever met a black person that I thought was black, darker than me. But she wasn't American. She spoke. She didn't even know English. She barely knew English. I'm like, my goodness. And I said, doesn't anybody speak English around here? Now, think about that. The arrogance of my ignorance. I'm in another country expecting people of this country to cater to me. I don't know what they've been through. I don't know the infrastructure. I don't know how they react. I don't know the culture. And the reason I didn't know is because I didn't have to know. It didn't affect me what they were doing in Germany. It didn't affect me what they're doing in Spain or Greece. It didn't affect me what was going on other than my own little situation. And I want to say this to, to, to many of our other brothers and sisters that are white, are Christian men, Christian women. What we have gone through traditionally as a people, you have to make a volitional effort to look into it. Because our experience with this country is just not the same. By and large, not all, not all, not all, not all cops, not all people that the cops deal with. But by and large, our interaction with the police force, with law enforcement, has just been a little different. I got fired from UAMS. And I should have been fired. Let me say that. I was 18, acting a fool. But the UAMS police came down there and he pat his gun. I said, I just want to remind you as he pats his gun, just to remind you. We can handle anything that comes up. And I'm like, what? Like, what, what did that come? What, why would I have to be threatened? Just, I mean, what, what is he talking about? Like, just the threat of bodily harm and violence to an employee that's just walking. RJ, one of the teachers, uh, called him a heathen or something like that. And we went, me and Danielle went, and she pulled out her iPad. She typing and transcribing notes. And I'm like, why in the world they got the gym coach? And he's big old tall, about 6'4", looked like he work out. I'm like, what are he in here for? And it took me a minute to recognize, oh, he's the security in case I act a fool. Oh. And the principal, she said those words. That people said to Obama, you speak so well. <laughs> you speak well. I didn't, well, I knew how to take it, but it's just something about living in a sinful world that can just, yeah, yeah. And so Ephesians 4, Mark 11, and then Luke chapter 13. I set this up this way to let you know the tone of the direction we're going to take. And we're going to get this from the word of God. And so, Father, we thank you for the privilege of Lord life. Thank you that things are as well as they are. Lord, I ask you for direction, for guidance. I ask you, Lord, to lead me, to lead us, all of us as your people, to be, Lord, just spirit-filled and wise in dealing with these various situations. 
I pray, Lord, for purity of heart, clarity of thought. As we go through your word, that you will speak to us in this unique time. Let your word be the reign, the rule, rather, of what we're to live by. And we ask you this in the name of Jesus. They all said amen. I gave all of that as a precursor to what we're going to talk about. I don't have any title to put on this. When they say, what did he preach? He preached the Bible. But as Christians, we are born from above. We are distinct, not odd, distinct. And how we handle things is differently. Christians don't act like the world. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We handle stress differently. We pray. We ask God for peace. We handle death differently. It pains us if someone's life has ended and they didn't know Christ. And there's a bittersweet feeling we feel when someone's life has ended that's a Christian because we know to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. But in Ephesians chapter four, as he talks about the worthy walk, verse one, and how we are different and how we are distinct and how we are, uh, uh, we don't act the same way as the world. In Ephesians four and verses 26 and 27, verses that many of us are familiar with, as Christians, we handle anger differently. I had a coworker years ago. No, no, this wasn't a coworker. This was a situation at Levi Strauss. He was my supervisor and he had a problem with calling me boy. The first time he said it, it sent shockwaves through my body and we were in this big, huge warehouse and he yelled it. And I, I wanted to run over it. No, no, I'll let that go. Cause you know, I mean, what you going to do? Go roll your sleeves up and get into some fight? But that's the flesh. And he said it to me again, and I explained to him why I didn't like it. He didn't say it anymore. But as Christians, we handle, <laughs> we handle anger differently. That's why Paul says these words, be angry. What? Anger is not some emotion that is eradicated from your body when you become a Christian. You should be angry at some things. He just said, when you're angry, be angry, but don't fall into sin. And don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Please put it in context. This is not saying that if you have some argument with your wife, Fix it up before you go to bed. If you can do that, that's always beneficial. If you can fix that, that always is a blessing. But there are married folks out there that know when you get angry at night, it ain't always fixed by the time you go to bed. The point behind the verse is that you should be working to get that situation resolved. Be angry, but don't let yourself sin. Sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You ought to be spending time trying to resolve that issue because you can't get to peace until you have first removed the problem. And the problem must be addressed. That's why it's hard when people would do mean things, cruel things, outwardly unbiblical things, sinful things, and you try to love them and pray for them and they fight, kick and scream and talk about everybody on their way out the door. They stay gone for a month and then come back like, okay, we still mad? Well, we can't get to peace because we've never addressed the problem. That warrant that you have is still on the books. That ticket you haven't paid, it's still on the books. That issue that you created, it is still there. It has to be resolved. And we live in a time to where what we are seeing has got to be resolved. It makes me angry when I see men and boys and women to what seems like unjustly killed. 
But what am I to do? Get angry and get a Molotov cocktail and burn up the Capitol? No. Get, get, get angry and, and, and flip over cars and spit at the police? No. no. Be angry and sin not. Listen, let me say this to you. Every police officer is not bad. Let, let, let's speak logically. Every police officer is not some person that's racist. No. It, wh what about the police officer that's a black man? What about the police officer that's a black woman. What about the police officer that's Native American? What about the police officer that's Hispanic? What about the police officer that's of Asian descent or something? Are they some kind of way racist because they were? No. To paint every policeman as if they are in the same boat would be equivalent to painting all black people as if they are in the same boat. It's not true. You can't paint a broad brush over every police officer. No, 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 you can't. That would be foolish to do so. So when you're angry, you cannot approach it with this general monolithic view that you're just going to just say all cops are bad. Well, Brother Lionel Timms is a police officer. He's not bad. I know of other police officers. They're not bad. Do you have some... Bad police officers? Yeah. Guess what? You got some bad church members. <laughs> you got some bad pastors out there. You got some bad Sunday school teachers. You got some immoral preachers, immoral deacons, immoral choir members, immoral piano players and drummers. Yes, but you can't say all of them are bad. Of course not. So when you're angry, don't fall into sin. How do you do it? Be angry at sin. And you're disgusted with sin so much that you don't step into it yourself. And that next verse, it says, neither giving place to the devil. Because you know what? If you don't work on getting that thing out of your heart, you create a special little room for the enemy to reside in. You create an atmosphere for him to thrive. You give him a launching pad in the flesh where he can wreak havoc in all other areas of your life. As Christians, we handle anger differently. Mark chapter 11. I want to take a very serious approach this morning. Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 15. In context, this is the end of the ministry of Christ. Not long before he's crucified. There is, we see, a justified anger. Oh, yeah, some stuff you're supposed to be mad at. When Jesus began his public ministry at the wedding of Cana in Galilee, he turned water into wine. Immediately in John 2 after that, he goes inside the temple. It's Passover time. The temple is flooded with people. The city is flooded with people. He sees the people who are selling oxen and animals for sacrifice, and they're given this upcharge. He sees the people who exchange the currency from different lands to the currency of, the, the, uh, of Jerusalem, and they give this you know, tax on it. He sees them making money off of God's people, robbing God's people. He takes a cord, makes whips, not to use on the people, but on the animals. Hundreds of thousands of people are in this Gentile court. It's big enough to where oxen and sheep and doves are being sold. Jesus turns over the table, money falls over, runs everybody out of there. He cleans out the temple. He was angry. Now, coincidentally, this goes against our view of Jesus, that he's just this loving God that looks like a shampoo model and just takes anything and just, oh, God bless you. Yes, he's patient. Yes, he's graceful. Yes, he is loving and kind and tender, but he's also just. And when he saw the wrong thing happening to his people in his house, he's the Lord of the temple. He cleaned it out. And here we are again in Mark 11. Three years later, right back in the same situation again. 
They started bad, he cleaned it, and here we are three years later. He's about to be crucified. He's about to be lied on, spat upon, beat, bruised, scourged, lifted high and wide, hang his head in the locks of his shoulder, and he's going to die. And guess what they're doing in Mark 11? The same thing again. Verse 15, they come to Jerusalem. He had just, you know, kind of cursed the fig tree. And Jesus went into the temple. And look what it says. He began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not allow any man that they would carry a vessel through the temple. Wait a minute. Is this the same story? No. There's a very important caveat that's missing. In John chapter 2, he cleans the temple with a whip. In Mark chapter 11, the second time, he cleansed the temple with his word. How did he get these people out of there? He's God and he's God all by himself. He was upset, verse 17, and he taught them. Let me teach y'all something, verse 17. Is it not written, Isaiah 56, Jeremiah 7, my house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer? Hasn't God's word in the law of Moses, the Old Testament even said that this place, this temple is to be for prayer, <coughs> not extortion? Didn't I just clean this out three years ago? Here I am again, three years. I'm about to die for the sins of this world. And y'all right back at it again. He said, you have made this a den of thieves. In verse 18, the scribe, the chief priest, when they heard it, they witnessed it, they saw it. They said, no, we got to kill him. But they feared him. They were afraid because all the people were astonished, amazed at his teaching, his doctrine. My point behind it, I don't want to go into the nuts and bolts of that. I want to take a general theme flyover and say, you know what? There is a time where anger is justified. Please be careful. Seeing what Jesus did with these tables does not mean we should go turn over stuff, burn up stuff, spray paint stuff. No, 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 no. Please don't take that out of context. Please don't take that out of context. This is not Jesus promoting civil unrest. No, 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 no. Not at all. No, don't go turning over buildings, defacing property that your tax dollars going to have to be taken to fix anyway. No, no, no. No, no. This is only to see the thrust of it. Jesus got angry when he saw most specifically wrongdoing in the church. In this case, the temple, in our vernacular, the church. We should be angry when we see injustice, wrongdoing, sin in the church, in ourselves, in our family, on the job, in society. People have asked me, about what's happening with the police, what's happening with this person being shot, that person being shot. They said, well, in, in essence, why would God let that happen? Why, why, why would God let that go on? Why, why wouldn't your God just stop seeing? Well, he eventually will, but let's just roll out that line of logic. How far do you want God to go? He need to stop murder, a, a rape, the, uh, 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 racism. And, and, I mean, people just give the list of sins. Okay. He should de just, just destroy all of this stuff. Now, now, now be careful because what about the sin that's in you? How far do you want God to go in eradicating and erasing sin? Yeah. It's easy to look at the sin of the world. Oh yeah. We live in a sinful world. It's a fallen world. Where did this begin? Genesis chapter three. In Genesis 1 and 2, you had man in fellowship with God. In Genesis 4 and following, you had murder, rape, lust, adultery. The list goes on and on. Where did it begin? Genesis chapter 2, when they disobeyed God. Coincidentally, how did Satan get them to disobey God? He challenged the authority of God's word. Has God really said? Has God really said? Did he really mean that? Let me replace it. Let me give you a revised edition. I just think, Eve, God wants you to not eat from that fruit. He's trying to keep you down. He knows that you'll have your eyes open and you'll be a God like him. 
The very thing that got us into the world we live in is lowering the authority of God's word, disobeying what we knew to be true from scripture. And from that point on, it has unfolded and there's many branches off of that sinful tree. And here we see Jesus angry. And guess what? There's nothing wrong with being angry. Be angry, but don't sin. And there is a justified anger. Sometimes you're supposed to be mad. It bothers me when I see some of these same patterns repeated with police officers and generally black men. Happens to white men, white women, black women. Generally, what we see and focus on, some in our community. Just like it bothers me when I'm sitting there in the pulpit, I got my Bible open and I'm listening to this preacher preach. I got my pen, I got my paper and I'm waiting on him to preach something from this book and he ain't said nothing from this book. That bothers me. Or if he does say something from the book, it's something that's wrong. That bothers me. When we see sin, there's nothing wrong with being angry. Either. You should be angry. How you act is a totally different question. Last passage, and I'm I'm kind of a broad approach here. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. And I need to dive right in on this one in Luke 13. I need for us to take a heavenly approach now. We've looked on earth. We, we could look at the problems of an immoral society, an immoral country, an immoral city, a corrupt, a corrupt people in government places, corrupt people in the church, corrupt people all over the world. This is a sinful world we live in. And for these folks talking about let's go to this country, that country, listen, you can go and go. I ain't going nowhere. I'm fine right here. Just, be, just because I criticize uh rightly, constructively criticize the ills of this country, of society, doesn't mean you got the right to tell me to go somewhere. No, I'm staying right here. I mean, you can go if you want to. I don't want to get too far into that. Luke 13. There were present at that season some that told him, Jesus, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. We see sacrifices, blood mingled together. The temple is where they would make sacrifices. So we would say in our vernacular, these were people who were at church making sacrifices, giving an animal, cutting its throat, laying it on the altar in honor of the God that they serve and love. And for some reason, don't have all the specific, Pilate, he didn't do it himself, sent men in there and killed them while they were sacrificing at the temple. These were people that were killed at church. They were at church worshiping God in this way. And Pilate, for some reason, sent men in there to kill them, these Galileans. We don't know why. And Jesus said to them, as they pose this question to him, or they tell him about it, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners above every other Galilean because they went through these things? And you know, people think that. The same way Job's friends, I use air quotes, thought that Job had to have been doing something wrong. You lost your money, you lost your servants, your health is bad, your marriage is on the rocks, your children have died. Job, tell us her name. She, uh, Listen, no man ever perished being righteous. You've done something to deserve this. That's the mindset. They were saying, these Galileans, they must have done something to deserve this. They died at church. God must be punishing them. And Jesus said, do you think that they were worth sinners because they died this way? Now, verse 4, we're going to skip the next two verses. Because the answer to each question is the same. Verse 4, now Jesus poses another argument. He said, y'all told me about this. Let me tell you about one. He said, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. 
Do you think that they were worse sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? The, the tower in Siloam. Siloam, there was a pool that was fed by the Gihon Spring. And, and they would have uh, aqueducts in Jerusalem under Pilate's leadership, the Roman rule. And these aqueducts would funnel water from this pool in Siloam to different parts of the city. Sometimes they would have towers erected to look at the water to make sure no one's tampering with it, or they could have been doing some kind of construction, maybe repairing this funnel or tube or whatever that was funneling water and a part of the tower or the scaffolding fail. This would be being at the wrong place at the wrong time. They weren't in church. They were just going about daily activities out of nowhere. A tower fell and killed 18 people. We don't know if these were all men, all women, a mixture of men, women, and children. It just said there were 18 people who were at the wrong place at the wrong time. We were just at the movies watching a movie, and the guy came in and just random, randomly started shooting. We were just at school going to class. A student came in with a gun and just started shooting up the school. We were coming out of a funeral. There was a gang fight, and a stray bullet hit me, hit my daughter, hit this person, and we died at the wrong place at the wrong time. And when that stuff happens, Jesus poses the question, do you think this stuff happened to these people because they were worse sinners than anyone else? Do, do, do you think that this happened to them because some kind of way they were at the bottom of the totem pole of sinners and I just had to take them out? The response of Jesus is the same in verse three about the people that were killed in the temple. He says, no, but except you repent, you're going to likewise perish in verse five regarding the 18 who were at the wrong place at the wrong time. The tower fell on them. Do you think they were worth sinners? He says in verse five, no, but except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Here's the heavenly view, the tragedy. And this is, this is hard to lift our focus from the current culture, the current situations that are so prevalent in our mind, but just lift your focus from earth and put it in heaven. The real tragedy is not how you die, when you die. The real tragedy is not even that you die because every last one of us is going to die one day. This warm body is going to turn cold. The real tragedy is, it's not being killed by an officer, not being shot in a movie theater, not being killed by a straight bullet at outside of a funeral or at school going to class. The real tragedy is not that you die, how you die, or when you die. The real tragedy is to die without Christ. That's the real tragedy. That's the If I am pulled over and some mix up happens and some lady says I she's afraid for her life and you got a 6'2 black man and a 5 foot white woman and the cops come and they assume I did something wrong they don't know I'm a preacher they don't know I'm not like that I didn't argue with her I don't know what she talking about and I end up getting shot and it's a bad shooting and I didn't do anything wrong yeah that would be bad my kids would miss me I'm sure the church and many others would miss me who love me but there's some good in that. If we can just have a heavenly view to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. There's a blessing in that. It's that when I die, I say bye-bye world and hello Jesus. Before this warm body turns cold, before the coroner gets the news, before Robinson Mortuary come and take my body and put me in a casket and flowers and resolutions and all that stuff are done, before any of that stuff take place, I'm rejoicing. I'm with my Savior. And I'm saying this for this reason, is that there are other things at play. That, that yes, it makes us angry when we see injustice. And we've been seeing some of this stuff for hundreds of years. Yes, it makes us angry when we see a repetitive pattern of this type of sin go on. And you want to get mad and you want to make sure in your anger as a Christian, you don't act foolish or lose your composure. Yes, there is a justified anger to where you can say, I see that. I don't like that. That is wrong. But also, yes, if you die today, have you given your life to Christ? 
Oh, yes, there'll be a legal battle over this police thing. And there'll be a politician talking on your behalf. And you may get some national attention and some national senator going to show up. Jesse Jackson coming, Joyce Elliott coming, whoever else is coming, the Democratic whoever going to make light of your situation. But if you have not given your life to Christ, all of that does not matter at all. The real tragedy is not being asleep in your apartment and a police busting in claims she didn't know it was her apartment, thought she was in her apartment and shoots you in bed in your own apartment. And the judge give her a hug, said, I'm so sorry that you killed this person in his own apartment. That's not the real tragedy. The real tragedy is to be in bed, somebody breaking your house and shoot you and you don't know Christ. I, I, I know it. That doesn't fit the narrative. CNN ain't going to talk about it. Fox News ain't going to bring it up. MSNBC, Channel 7, Fox 16, Channel 11, Channel 4. No one's going to talk about this. The real tragedy is when you die, because you're going to die one day, is to die without your heart given to Christ. Because 10 out of 10 of us are going to die, people. Yes, we should be angry when we see injustice of any kind. In the church, in the streets, in society, in politics, with the police officers, on the job, everywhere. We should have a disdain for sin, not just in the world, even the sin in us. Lord, help me get this thing out of me. Help me stop doing this. Help me stop acting this way. Help me stop going to these places. Help me stop keeping this thing in my heart. Get this out of me. The, the same way you see sin in other areas and you want it eradicated, when you see sin in your own soul, Lord, please cleanse me. Wash me, wipe me, make me whiter than snow. Yes, we should be angry, upset. There's a justified anger. But the real tragedy, listen to me, people, is if you die and you haven't given your heart to Christ, I don't care what they say at your funeral. I don't care who comes to speak. I don't care what dignitary, what politician is going to say a few words and be all in the pulpit that don't need to be in the pulpit. But just because they're a senator, they're going to let them in the pulpit. Matters not. If you didn't know Jesus, I'm saying that to bring this to a close right here. Let me encourage you not to put the cart before the horse. Let me encourage each and every one of you. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world to where what's wrong is called right to where people glory in their shame. They glorify things they should be ashamed of. They promote things that they should be even ashamed to have their name attached to. Yes, that's the world we live in. And guess what? Sooner or later, Jesus is going to fix it up. He's coming back again. People are living like they're not going to die one day. We will see him again. As Christians, we have a different agenda in mind. Let me encourage you to give your life to Christ. Please, please, please. Tomorrow's not promised. That's why the book of James, he tells us, don't say next week we'll go here and do that. You say, if the Lord wills. That's a way of reminding yourself that, listen, I may not even be here next month next year for that vacation. If the Lord wills, we'll see you next Sunday. If the Lord wills, we'll do the Bible questions on Wednesday. If he wills, if he allows, if that's in the plan, because I don't know if that's in the plan. And let me encourage you to please give yourself to him. Yes, look at the stuff. You have a reason to be angry. White people, black people alike. When you see injustice, it's just wrong. Wrong is just wrong. Doesn't matter who it's done to or who it's done by. Wrong is just wrong. Be angry, but don't sin. And yes, there's a way that you should be angry. Justified anger, but you still don't lose your Christian composure. But while we're going back and forth in this arena and that arena, the, the world of politics, the world of social, economic, background, financial, this, that, and the other, you better look to the hills from whence come with your help. Because all your help is going to come from the Lord. You better make sure you have a relationship with him. How do we do that? 
if you confess with your mouth, Paul said, the Lord Jesus. And what that means is that you openly declare Jesus died for me. He, he, we could be gone in a minute, Sister Cheryl Brown. That's right. Jesus died for me. He gave his life for me. And to know he did that for me, I need to live for him. I'm sorry. It pushes you to repent. I'm sorry, Lord, for being someone that has openly, whether I knew it or not, was rebelling against you in my disobedience. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Create in me a clean heart. I want salvation. And that only comes through Jesus Christ. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe the biblical account that Jesus lived and died for your sins. And early that Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power. If you believe that, you shall be saved. You're not saved because you're a pastor. Not necessarily. You're not saved because you're a church member, because you work in the church. Not necessarily. You're saved because you believe the biblical account that God has his son, Jesus, that was born of a virgin, that walked and lived for 33 years. He died one Friday for your sins and mine. And early Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. He died for your sins and mine. And he got up from the grave. Believing that is called salvation. So we're going to close with a, with a prayer. Um, this one was a bit over the limit, but we needed to do this. Let me encourage you. Listen, whatever protest you want to do, feel free. It's, it's a right granted to the people of this great country we live in. But we serve and are accountable to a higher authority. That is the authority of God's word. You see, it doesn't matter what the culture says is right or wrong, per, per se, let me say that. Because the culture at one time said some things were right that biblically were wrong. <laughs> at one time, slavery was legal, <laughs> but it was still wrong, according to scripture. Our accountability is to God's word. He is the highest authority. And if some legal name, uh, some legal person says, well, this is legal now. Not for the Christian, it ain't. Well, it's a law now. You can't do this. The Bible says I can. And so every tub is going to have to sit on its own bottom and make a decision one day, probably not too far in the future. But let me ask you to bow with me. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Let's, let's have us a word of prayer and we'll close with prayer. Father, thank you for what our ears have heard, our eyes have seen. Thank you for instruction and guidance that can only come from your word. Help us, Father, to have a justified anger. And help us when we are angry at sin of any kind, even the sin in us. Help us when we're angry at sin not to step into sin. And Father, through it all, although we can see the turmoil and tragedy in the world, help us to still have a view on heaven. To know, Father, that we still have a mission, a mandate from you to tell somebody about your son who died for our sins. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done. We give you all the praise. We ask you all of this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen. Brother Brown, thank you too. Deacon Davis, thank you. I appreciate you. I, I hope, Sister Tapping, God bless you too. I hope you're doing well too, Sister Tapping. Uh, I want to say a special word. I know some of you may be logging off now, but I want to say a special word. Uh, uh, I have on my heart, y'all, please remember our seniors, uh, those who are in the homes. I know there are some in my age and younger who just ready to get back to church. Lord knows I'm ready. But you can't just think about yourself. You can't. Yes, for Mother Davis. Yeah, didn't have to wake me this morning, but he did. Yes, he did. Yeah, I can hear that voice right now. Amen. Amen. Sister Mitchell, Sister Loud. We can't just think of ourselves when it's time to go back into the church. L listen, there are people who are older than you that have different health conditions than you, that you would be blessed to be their age. So we have to be considerate. And I say that I know many are, are kind of questioning, when we going back, when we going back? Listen, I don't know. I, I, I do not know. I, I was speaking with somebody yesterday. It was a 
young lady in a, in a coffee place. And she was real sweet, real nice. And she said their church in Hot Springs went back to church in May. And they went for two months. They had to shut it down. I said, what happened? Three people came infected with the virus, with COVID-19. You, you just don't know. And let me tell you something, New Hebrew. It doesn't take but one person to get sick. One person. And when everything dies down and when everything goes back to normal, people still going to be a little bit hesitant to come back to New Hebrew again. And guess what they're going to say? They're not going to say, brother so-and-so, so and so so and so They're going to say, Pastor Smith. <laughs> they're going to know my name at that point. That preacher done put them folk back in there no good and well. They said, yeah, yeah. Hey, come with the territory. But the point being, when, when people call me and ask me and question me, the answer's still the same. Still the same. Listen, I don't know. I know. Hey, Sister Kendra Mahomes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, y'all listen, be safe. If you feel comfortable wearing a mask, wear one. If you don't want one, want to wear one, hey, that's your business. It's your hell. You know, some places won't let you in. That's just, that's a personal choice, you know. But the point is, be as, be as wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. You know, be wise, be safe, wash your hands. Amen, somebody. So we'll go ahead and close right here. I appreciate all of you and I love you. Lord willing, amen. We'll come back Wednesday with the Bible questions. And if you have any Bible questions, please feel free to submit those. And we'll make sure that, uh, you know, we'll try to answer those, Lord willing, this Wednesday coming up. So God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. And I hope to see you guys again coming up soon. Amen.